I'm about to do something that's actually very uncomfortable. <clears throat> Let's talk about myself. I don't like it. But for reasons that have been described to me multiple times over the last several years, it's something that I need to do. And that's, ah, it's frustrating because I think that the, uh, uh, the tendencies to sound egotistical when talking about one's own life are really strong or the, the likeliness that one can come off that way is inevitable. And I hate that. <clears throat> but as far as who I am and my life with firearms, I do think that these two things are very relevant and important to talk about. So I'm going to start at the beginning. My life started off in a family that was surrounded by and all about firearms. Now, to give you a bit of an idea, my grandfather was the president of the Houston Gun Collectors Association down in Texas, and my father was raised with that. He was raised with antique firearms, mostly centered around the, uh, the Civil War, United States Civil War. Some pieces, if I remember correctly, date back to the Revolutionary War, but uh, there was a heavy focus on the Civil War. Now, I consider myself to be incredibly blessed and fortunate that I was able to be raised around these things. I mean, I got, I was able to be introduced to flint locks and percussion caps and muzzle loaders and smooth bores and dueling sets and Apache knuckle dusters and all the mats and uh, all these different things that most people had never even heard of. My Some of my earliest memories were playing with uh, a cane shotgun or a bucket of bayonets that I wasn't allowed to play with, but, you know, as a kid, still do. And uh, that's what I was raised around. That's what I thought was awesome, and I loved it. Now, in my early life, as awesome as I thought it was, I didn't take into full consideration, I mean, I was a kid, right? I didn't take into full consideration the, uh, the effect that these things have and how far I would take firearms in my life. I always knew I liked them, always knew I loved them and had fun with them, but I never, I guess, grasped how far I was gonna take firearms. It ended up I took it pretty far. Now, I was asked recently when the first time I, I or how old was I when I first fired a firearm? <clears throat> I'm not exactly sure. I, uh, I want to say four, five. I'd have to ask my father. Um, I just decided to do this video like 30 minutes ago, so no prep work. And <laughs> I remember, uh, this sounds like a, a, a tall tale or something, but when I was a kid, so I grew up in the Pacific Northwest in Washington. So I grew up bear and elk hunting primarily with my father. And 
it was a big deal to us. Like I'd get pulled out of school like on Thursday or Friday to make sure we had a long weekend up in the mountains to go hunting, which I always thought was awesome. Like I felt significantly cooler than any other kid around me that we able to do that. Um, especially because the area I grew up in, a lot of kids didn't do that. And uh, up at elk camp once, my uh, there's a stump out in front. My dad, he grabs those little pieces of styrofoam you know, that your meat hamburger comes in or whatever, and he takes his knife and he stabs it into the uh, tree and, because uh, we're getting ready to shoot it, and the first thing out of his mouth was, don't shoot my knife. Well, me and my dad and a family friend, and I, I don't know, man, I couldn't have been more than uh, eight, nine. I'm not really too good at placing the age I was at the time it was, so. Um, anyway, first shot from a Colt 22 Woodsman, 22 long rifle, yeah. First shot, split that bullet on a knife. And uh, my dad goes up, he looks at it, and you can see the scratch marks on the blade, and you see the two halves of the bullet on each side. And I mean, he just told his kid not to shoot his knife, but then his kid split a bullet on a knife. So I didn't get in trouble at all, at least not that I remember, but I remember thinking that was pretty cool. Um, and there was another time I can remember uh, up scouting for the coming up elk season, and I my first gun given to me was a I think it was a Savage 22 long rifle crack shot, um, single shot peep sights, and the butt plate was stamped with the logo of the Houston Gun Collectors Association. It was something that he had won when he was a kid. And then he gave me a brick, those old Remington bricks of uh, 500 rounds, 550 rounds, I think they are. He set it down and just told me to shoot while he went off and took a nap. So I did, I just shot. I, sh I shot hundreds of rounds, single shot, unlock the breech, pull the casing out, put another round in, lock it back. And I was shooting the tips off of uh, little pine trees all around. And that's largely how I grew up, was like that. And I mean, then we, I had bows and arrows, had wrist rockets, had blow guns. We hid that from my mother until uh, she ended up finding out. But um, <clears throat> basically anything that was a projectile, I was not allowed to have rubber band guns. Which thinking about it now, I'm an adult. I can make that decision on my own. I should get one. But I was not allowed to have rubber band guns. I think the consensus was he's absolutely going to shoot um, his brothers. Well, I shot my brothers with the blow guns, so... I definitely would have done it with a rubber band gun. Um, anyways, but that's how I grew up. Always going up shooting, always going to the mountains, um, mainly 22s. The first large caliber rifle I shot was a, a 30-30 lever gun. Of course, it was a Henry. And um, I remember thinking that this is awesome. Now, I didn't, I didn't go through hunter safety as a kid. I didn't do any of that. Um, I guess they're I don't know, it really wasn't a point because it got to a, I got to a certain age where 9/11 um, happened, and then my father was overseas contracting, and heck, he's still there, right? So <clears throat> it got to a point in my life where there was a long period where there was no hunting, there was no mountain trips, nothing like that, not nearly as much as when I was littler. But then. Uh, he came back once and we boogied on up to Canada and we spent two weeks up there moose and bear hunting and I shot all the grouse that you could possibly shoot on one trip with a 1022. And I mean, I think one of the first techniques that I was taught that made me think um, to be strategic about shooting was shooting grouse up in Canada. There were three all sitting above each other on a, on a tree. I was about to start shooting the top one, and before I, uh, I had pressed the shot, the guide said, shoot the bottom one first because he'll fall, and then the other ones will fall. If you shoot the top, they'll fall and scare off the rest. And I was like, stupid, simple little thing, but I'm a kid, right? I didn't even think about it. And I was like, oh, okay, so that's what I did. Boom, 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 knocked them all down. And uh, I mean, I grew up very much thinking and assuming that, hey, I know guns, I know what I'm doing. Look at this, I shoot it. Like, I was safe, but I wasn't, uh, I never had an incident, but I wasn't nearly as safe as I could have been. Um, I was very much under the guise of, because I was raised by it and around it, that I knew what I was doing. But, I mean, I couldn't tell you the parts. I couldn't tell you what a charging handle was. I couldn't tell you what the magwa was. I can make inferences and probably get it right and uh, all these different things. 
I was calling it a clip. Let's put it like that. I was calling it a clip. I was young. I was naive. Don't hate on me. Now, I always had a strong interest in guns. I, it was one of the reasons why I wanted to join the Marine Corps at such an early age. I was like, oh, this is an organization entirely dedicated to it. That sounds pretty cool in my opinion. So that's what I had wanted to do. And that's what I went off and did. I mean, even before that though, I was teaching people what I knew, um, friends that wanted to go up and shoot and I'd show them, you know, as much as I could, how to do it in a uh, safe way. And I'd get them to hit. And it was always something I was extremely interested in. And I remember multiple times thinking there's gotta be more, there's gotta be more. And then before I jump ahead back to the Marine Corps, I came across as in a sportsman's warehouse, a book, the Ultimate Sniper Volume 2 by John Plaster, I think his name was, John Plaster. I mean, this is a book like that thick and roughly that big. And it was all about, yeah, sniping, but shooting. Like there was, that was my first legitimate formal education in shooting. Um, and I thought it was fantastic. It went into bullets, optics, ballistics. It went into different firearms types, went into selection on it, how to index the firearm, how tactics, techniques, and procedures that snipers, but shooters can employ. And it went into route selection, tracking people. It went into all this stuff. And I thought it was fantastic. So much so I'm taking this thing, I'm taking this thing to school and I'm reading it. And I mean, the other kids are looking at me weird. I didn't, I never got a single word that said to me by any teachers. The quiet kid did though, when he brought a gun to school. Um, but I remember, uh, I remember reading that and I mean, I was, I was never any good at school. I was good. At, I was smart and I was, um, well-spoken, but, uh, school to me was a vacation from the whole life. So I went to school to chill out and relax. But anyway, I had that book and that's, that was what I thought was really awesome. And along with all the other books I read about, um, well, sniping, because that's what I, um, was really interested in growing up and it, it directly related to shooting and these are guys that were doing it to a professional a professional it's probably not the right word for that time or how I thought but to the highest degree that people knew of at the time um, so and I remember one time mentioning that I wanted to do shooting competitions I didn't know if they were a thing I was like oh I don't, I don't know if these are a thing but I would like to do them if they are it never went anywhere which is fine but uh I mean, I remedied that later in life, obviously, but fast forward. So then I joined the Marine Corps, go infantry contract, do all that. And, uh, I get in and I love the infantryman's job. I always had a hard time in my platoon, um, whether due to injuries or just, I was older than a majority of my guys in the platoon. And I was never one who fit in with a crowd anyway. Um, I was always the kind of person to have um, close friends of quality, not many friends. <clears throat> so that uh, that always ruffled some feathers in the platoon. And I didn't really care. I also have a habit of uh, showing you where your faults lie. And it's something that's been a problem in my life a lot <clears throat> for a lot of different reasons. But... Uh, and you know, I, I'm not, I'm not ashamed of that, but I'm also not proud of it either. It's, it's something that I do find valuable in me that I am able to discern the truth of a person. And again, it's not a, not again, but it's not always a hundred percent correct, but majority of the time I'm pretty spot on. Um, but then like I got approached by my platoon sergeant, Staff Sergeant Rubel, if you're out there and you're seeing this, call me. I love you and I miss you. You are literally the best thing, um, besides my two brothers that happened to me in the Marine Corps. Um, on my, um, on my second UDP to Okinawa, um, he approached me I, I know, a couple months before the, uh, the UDP was up and I only had a, like six months after that until I was out of the Marine Corps. And he basically just said, Karugi, I know you don't like being with the platoon. I know you like to work in the field. You're coming up on when you're getting out. Like, what do you want to do? Like, do you, 
Do you want to be fapped out, which is the fleet assistant program? You basically just move to another unit and take up any other job that, uh, like, I don't know, I remember. Go to headquarters, you can work in the gym, you can base security, all that kind of stuff. Or you can do what I decided, what I asked them to do. I was like, send me to coach's course and send me to the range. Like, that's what I want to do. I want to shoot and I want to work. I don't want to sit on my ass every day. I don't want to do the, you know, just filling time like infantrymen do. I want to go shoot and uh, teach on the range. Okay. And that was that was it. Within a couple weeks, the my unit was off to Korea and I was going to coach's course. And uh, <clears throat> I mean, that one certificate is really what set me up for the future I was about to have. So I went there and I did it. I crushed that course and that gave me another base of knowledge like so far you had my life <clears throat> growing up with firearms then you had this book from um, the ultimate sniper and then you have marine corps boot camp teaching the fundamentals of marksmanship and the uh, all those different things and then you have coaches course so you have these four aspects that are now just stacking on top and i'm kind of figuring out my way through all this and uh, the way i see it is I grew up very much backwoods with the gun and thinking I knew everything and then I got humbled by a book that showed me the uh, that showed me that taught me the way to do it and the ways to think about it and how to dissect and discern and all that but it was still very um, as formal as that book was for me I still hadn't had the practical application as in the instruction behind it so then I get into boot camp and now comes the hands-on instruction and I get a coach's course and now I'm someone who's been around and on these guns for multiple years, sleeping with them, living with them, um, all, all you can imagine with them and taking care of them better than me. And now I get the instruction to, hey, this is how you talk about it. This is how you instruct it. And these are the things you can look for, like the seven common factors um, of marksmanship and uh, muscular and skeletal support and all that kind of stuff. Um, high firm grip all this kind of things, right? <clears throat> and they're just packing on all this knowledge and the more I get, the more I like it. So then for the rest of that de that deployment, or deployment, UDP, Unit Deployment Program, um, I'm on the range. Like I just told my, I, I told, I asked my staff sergeant like, hey, there's all these ranges coming up. We aren't doing anything. Everything that we are doing, I've done multiple times over again. Can I just go to the range and coach? Roger that. Go get them. All right. So I got sent over there and that's, I was kind of on my <laughs> OFP own fucking program for um, a few months until that was over. And I was teaching. Uh, during this time, I got promoted to corporal, uh, which ruffled feathers in the platoon, which I was completely fine with. Um, it's not, mm, it's not my fault that uh, people didn't. It was my fault that I did though. So I'm good with that. And so I went and I coached on the range and I ate up every second of it. Um, I was learning, like, yeah, I'm coaching, but I'm learning. I am gaining experience. I am trying things. I am, like, for example, in Okinawa, we had a rainstorm on a range once, shooting 500 yards with an EOTech, or EOTech, excuse me, uh, ACOG, RCO, Reflex Combat Optic. And there's so much rain on my objective lens that I can't see the target, but what I can see is the blur, the red blur of my reticle, and I can see the black blur of the silhouette. So I just lined up things how I knew they were supposed to look as best I could and started uh, hitting the targets. Now there's always pit love, so who knows what's going on, but as far as I understand, I was doing just fine hitting the targets and then doing different things there, and it, it was a great time. <clears throat> so then the plan was, as soon as I got back from deployment, I went on leave and I come back from leave and I think two days later, I'm switched over to headquarters, um, headquarters battalion. Yeah, and then I'm, I'm living out on the range in Pualoa, Hawaii and teaching there. I get there, I get my, my room and I'm excited. I'm like, okay, now I got like X amount of time before I get out, I'm gonna shoot, I'm gonna teach, it's gonna be great, I'm gonna learn. And within a few days, before I'd ever even uh, stepped foot on the range to do anything there, um, one of the guys that's about to leave comes in, and I have uh, 
I have videos, uh, precision rifle series videos on YouTube playing on my uh, computer behind me, and I because I would play them just so I'd pick up on things and watch and while I was doing other stuff, and that showed the guy behind me that was about to leave that hey he's actually really into this I like this, and then he told uh, hire I want him I want Karugi to take over here so they immediately moved me to the marksmanship training unit and I went through CMT combat marksmanship trainers course so now I'm the one teaching the coaches um, and so I did that for six months um, that was like 4 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day teaching um, teaching shooting and then we had have government entities come out on the ranges and uh, like FBI sniper team, so I got the, I would make sure like, okay, I'm on this own separate program with the MTU on the range. Staff Sergeant, here's everything I've done for the day. Everything you told me to do is done. Can I go check that out? Yeah, go ahead. So going over there, I spent time there. Like I made sure my work was done so that I can continue working and learning with the opportunities that were there. And again, that pissed people off. Um, there were jokes being cracked that, uh, I didn't work or that I was on my own program or anything like that, but the fact of the matter was like, I was on a separate, you know, chain of command of the range with the MTU. The person that was in charge of me told me I was good to go and I'd done everything. So I took the opportunity afforded there and I did it. And that pisses people off. And this is a common thing is, I tend to piss people off when I'm taking the opportunities that I seek. And uh, as I'm thinking about that now, I'm, act I'm completely fine with that. But what I'm not fine with is how people don't understand that they should be doing the same damn thing instead of just fitting in the mold that uh, they're surrounded by. <clears throat> so hanging out with FBI snipers, watching them for the day and uh, shooting the SR-25s. And <laughs> the main instructor there was getting ready to leave, so he was teaching his next guy to uh, take over his place. and. So I'm shooting their guns and they didn't want me to show my target because I was shooting better than their students. But my excuse, what I told the guys, like I do this every single day. I mean, I'm teaching these things and the guy that was about to take over the position for the FBI instructor, sniper instructor, <clears throat> he couldn't explain where your eyes should be focused and why. So they asked me and I told them like, oh, you know, this is how I explain it and this is why and it seems to work. So. Then, uh, you know, there were other instances. We did a lot of um, recreational shoots. We would host shoots for wounded warriors, and that gave me a lot of experience teaching people with different disabilities um, from the war. I remember one guy very specifically he came up to me, and he was big. He was a big, buff-looking guy. And I can't remember the nature of his injury, but what I do remember is that he could barely hold a pistol up. He may have looked buff, but he could barely hold a pistol up. So it's like, okay, these are problems I have to solve in order to be able to get you guys to shoot, not just safely, but effectively. So that was a really interesting thing. And still to this day, when I get uh, shooters that have something, like I've had some with Parkinson's, or I've had some come over with other disabilities in their shoulders or backs, or some that um, because of the life they'd live and the work they'd done, they couldn't get into prone. Like those are things I actually get kind of excited for because here's another challenge, here's another opportunity to learn. I've had one shooter for a scope rifle class. I didn't have him, he could not be in the prone. Okay, so you're sh at the lowest position you have to you is sitting on a tripod this whole course. And uh, I've had others where they couldn't, it was too much um, of a drain on their energy because of their age and injuries to be down on the ground at all. Okay, standing tripod, that's what we got, that's what we're doing, right? So that's, I kind of take pride in the fact that I do make sure to adjust um, the class and the course for each, each person that I get, each individual, each injury, stuff like that. <clears throat> and, completely sidetrack, rec fire, uh, recreational fire. So we did a lot of that there and I thought it was awesome. Now this, I got a little ahead of myself. Before I went to the range, before our, uh, my second to last, no, before my last UDP, excuse me, only did two, um, there was an opportunity to do a uh, shooting competition out at the range. And I was like, yo, I'm, I'm interested to put my, hand, put my hat in for that, right? Uh, it was a Pacific Division match. 
And what that essentially meant is I was gonna be shooting service rifles and pistols in a match. First, they're gonna give us classes and they're gonna shoot us in a match. But what I, um, what I do remember is that they also told us they were scouting for the uh, Marine Corps marksmanship team. And I thought that sounded really cool. <clears throat> so, a little backstory before I jump into that was I had gotten injured pretty bad. I tore a, a MCL and a meniscus and dislocated my patella um, like my first two or three months in the fleet. And that had ostracized me from a lot of the platoon because I just got there and I'm busted. And the Marine Corps infantry mindset is if you're broke or injured, it doesn't matter, you keep going. It does not matter. And I completely disagree with that. If you're broke or injured and you're training up, like take the time to heal because you have the rest of your life. And this is a message I want to get out to anyone else that's watching this that I'm getting on a soapbox. If you're in and you're not taking care of yourself, you've got to think your life hopefully will extend further than the Marine Corps. And if you don't take care of yourself then and now, regardless of what the people around you are saying, you're setting up your entire life to live by their demands. Take care of it, fix it. I pushed uh, like hell to get mine taken care of. I couldn't get an MRI until I think two months after the injury, something like that. And uh, I was told by my platoon commander that I wasn't gonna make deployment. And immediately, I mean, this is what I was living for, right? So tears, I'm like, sir, that's not gonna happen, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I just kept saying I'm fine. It was no big deal. And uh, so as much shit as getting, as much as it was difficult to fuck even run at that time, I was trying to make sure that I was making that deployment. And I did, but much to the uh, degradation of my own knee. And when I think back on it, the truth is like as much as I was trying to do that for myself, I also wanted to be part of the dudes. Well, there's two of those guys still around me now, and they're my brothers. They're the best things I got out of the Marine Corps. And the rest that I was trying to make happy, like, why the fuck was I doing that? Hindsight being 2020 as it is, like, that didn't matter at all. What mattered is me taking care of me. So there becomes this, uh, this negative feeling inside the platoon against me, which as much as that bugged me, honestly, it's a problem with them. So... When I stick my hand up for a shooting competition and it comes up, hey, Karugi's gonna be gone for two weeks, a week of classes and a week of comp, and the unit, the platoon and everything, uh, the company, Alpha Company, is going out to uh, the field, people get pissed because they think I'm living it easy. Again, another instance of me taking the opportunity presented in front of me to further an interest and a passion of mine. And the way I saw it is like, how are you? How can you be pissed at this? I'm gonna go learn how to shoot better. That's good for me and that's good for you guys. And I can pass that to you guys. Like, how is that a bad thing? Or you want me to go do the same exact exercise and training that we've done a million times. So I shot the match and I, I missed meddling, I think by like one or two points. Um, but the funny thing was, so the way it works is you have three days of shooting, you're shooting the same course of fire each day. And then it's a, the total score that you have is the aggregate of that. Now day two was an extremely high wind day and it, met, it dropped people 10 to 20 points on some. I shot, I think it was a 253. I shot the same exact score each day. Same score every day. And I missed meddling by like two or three, one or two, three points, something really, really close. But with that, I mean, there were there was a lot of shooters. That many shooters and that high, um, high caliber of shooters, like um, it's fractions of points that are making the difference. But to me, I thought it was really cool. Like that was the first one I'd ever done. Um, it's service rifle and service pistol and the service pistol is all like one-handed type stuff. Um, <clears throat> And I had a blast. I had a great time. I'm on a range, I'm shooting, I'm learning, I'm getting through a process, and I still remember my process for that type of shooting. But these things, like, these set up the foundation of what I still believe is important in your marksmanship, and that's being able to do everything organically to your body. If you can build that position within your own body, the environment's easier. 
and understanding that too. So <clears throat> getting a little long winded in the gills, I suppose. So then uh, fast forward again back to um, now I'm teaching and shooting on the range and I got, I'm buying my own rifle and I'm just, that's all I'm doing, I'm shooting. And I jump into a pistol competition and I start doing a pistol competition. I think I did two of them, um, which I thought was excellent. I'm, I'm now, I see how the competition world is going. I'm watching a lot of these older Filipino guys who are just crushing it. And one thing I saw a lot that I did not like was people showing up to the match, shooting the match and leaving. Not staying to help out, not staying to clean up, not staying to set up, stuff like that. Irks the shit out of me. My whole life I've always done that. Show up early, help out, regardless of what it is. Stay late and uh, help take down. Um, so I'm shooting these pistol matches. I'm borrowing a pistol from a buddy and uh, HK VP9, right? So the first one, my service pistol was a Beretta 92, which I hate, but obviously since I was teaching them and shooting them, I had to learn it. <clears throat> and then the HK VP9, which um, shot great until someone messed with it and uh, not me and it wouldn't shoot anyone so and fast forward and it comes I decide to get out it's taken me a long time to realize what this was but I knew while I was in that the Marine Corps was a place that didn't allow me to explore everything about myself I never knew what that was until I think this last few months, this last year, and that was uh, the creative side of me. Um, at least to me, it wasn't a place that I could explore that. So when I, I got out and I started doing, um, well, and after Seattle, I started doing the stuff like this and getting more into it. It really showed me uh, some parts of me that were missing my whole life. Now, I'm out of the Marine Corps. I'm done instructing there. What am I gonna do? I got out on a Friday, I flew home Saturday, I signed my first contract overseas on um, on Monday. Got all the paperwork done and so then I flew and did a security job in Kuwait. And that was probably the most miserable thing ever. So I stayed just long enough to get contacts for jobs over in, in Afghanistan and then I left. Um, did the contract work for Afghanistan. I got all the paperwork done, sent, and then I took off there into Kandahar and then uh, Jalalabad, where I spent uh, just about a year. And uh, the time there, I was networking and developing and uh, growing. And that's when uh, I got the line on a the lead on a job in Iraq, which uh, as a firearms instructor. So I took it, and uh, and then I spent the next two years there as a firearms instructor in, on the U.S. Embassy in Iraq, in Baghdad, which, again, I run into a situation where I took an opportunity afforded to me that my credentials clearly stated I was good for, and it pissed people off that were around me that were older and uh, had more experience doing what they were doing, and uh, they didn't like that. They didn't like that someone younger, with no combat experience either, that was one thing that pissed people off. Someone that was younger and like that came in confident in what he knew. And it was because of the nature of my background already. And um, didn't fit into the cadre there. But I stayed and I sacrificed a lot of my own health uh, mentally and emotionally to make sure I stayed there because of the job I had and uh, because of the money it paid. Now, when I was done with this job there, um, this was in January 2020, I go home and now I need to figure out something else for me. And I need to, I, I didn't want to contract anymore. I wanted out of the world. So I started looking into private investigation. I started get, I got my licenses for that and uh, started doing that kind of work. And actually my, my second job as a PI was the Seattle incident, was the Seattle riot incident, where um, everything blew up for me. But I mean, the thing that I kind of find funny, ironic, is two days before that, I was on the phone with a buddy, um, Ricky Crawley of uh, Achilles Heel Tactical. He was one of the guys in my, in my unit, Sniper Platoon. So we had come across each other's path before, and I was on the phone with him a few, two days prior to the Seattle incident, like, hey, I want to get in the industry. I'm going to start a business. This is what I'm thinking about doing. 
what do you think? Any tips, tricks, or pointers or whatever? Because he, AHT, Achilles Hill, had already been wildly successful pretty early on. And uh, <laughs> then three days later, he was calling me saying, why the fuck are you on the news? Um, so when all that happened, and if you guys want to watch videos on that, that's I did videos on that, so I don't got to explain it here. Um, for a couple reasons, I decided to press the advantage that was just afforded me. One, the big one was it's COVID, money's super tight. Um, I know people make money off of doing this. It's in an industry I was already trying to get into. It's doing something that I'm already passionate about. Let's do that. I'm going to, I'm going to do whatever I can to do that. I had, while I was in Afghanistan, I had, uh, gotten a, gotten pretty good at networking. So I used that skill and I tried to develop that and, uh, figure out my way through everything while I was building all this and taking the advantage that, uh, not advantage, uh, well, taking advantage of the opportunity that I afforded myself because I lived my truth and I decided that, uh, well, just like multiple times in my life, regardless of what other people thought, said, or did, or wanted me to do, I did what I thought was right for me. And that's actually something that I'm realizing as I'm talking about this is a reoccurring theme, and I'm proud of that in myself. So I'm gonna make sure I keep doing that. Um, so I, I do that and I, I start, you know, Technically, the company's called Bang Bags LLC. It's named after the uh, product, but everyone knew Weapon Snatcher, so that's why I have the, the, you know, everything, social media, website, and all that kind of stuff. It's all as Weapon Snatcher. <sighs> Problem there, I'm working on sorting it out still, um, and I'm gonna be fixing that within this next year, so <laughs> make sure to stay tuned for that. But anyway, so then I, now I'm starting to get multiple requests to my inbox. Now I didn't have, I didn't want to start a business in the industry instructing. That's not what I was doing. It was actually bank bags and I wanted to get more into the gear side of it. Um, but money's tight and I had recently before all that posted up videos that I sent to a close friend of mine on uh, basically videos he could refer to while trying to play with a, play with a pistol, trying to learn himself how to shoot a pistol. And I had them on my phone. So before that, I had just been posting them just to my um, Shooter Rugi account, which I started back in like 2016, 2015, me and a buddy did. Um, he started one too then. As something to, I always had the idea of like, I'm gonna get in the industry somehow, I'm gonna um, do something with shooting this. I was always taking videos and stuff like that. And I was always uh, looking at my own performance and trying to get better. Um, it was really in my, before the social media and paying attention to shooters online was something that I was even aware of doing. Um, people were already doing it, but I wasn't aware of it at this time. I mean, I had next to no social media and the ones I did have were completely anonymous. Um, so, so I started that account and that's, I had posted those videos to that and people were looking at those because my account had just blown up and I'm starting to get messages and requests to train to be to taught teach so I was like money's tight I'm gonna do this so I did that and then it got to be so much so large and I'm learning all these business related lessons um, I was like okay I'm gonna put these on the website you know I'm just gonna put them up there and that's how that kind of developed I was like okay well <clears throat> I had, uh, I had had my confidence pretty much shaken in the instructing side, so I went out to, uh, I met up with Kalen uh, Wojcik and uh, took his precision rifle class um, out in Yakima. And my confidence as an instructor was really restored through some of the things that he had said and my performance that I had dic dictated. Um, I had showcased there, so then I'm just, going back through this journey of just building myself up and my confidence and my uh, now I'm learning how to put curriculums together and now I'm learning how to do all that which I mean I had the training in in the Marine Corps by reading the manuals by being taught them by doing the st course studies and all that TLOs ELOs all that I wasn't taught hey how this is how you put it together 
but I was shown a good format and what good looked like, so there. Now, so I do that and I start a pistol and carbine or rifle and then I start doing a scope rifle course because that's one thing I love to do and I wanted to teach a class doing it, but also it was a hole that I saw, at least in my area, and especially during COVID, people getting guns, buying guns in COVID and not knowing what to do with them. So here's two days. Now it's a scope rifle essentials course, but now it's two days and you get everything from zero to a hundred on how for you and your gun to be set up and what you can do as an employment wise at least. Um, and it's my most sought class still. So I think it's pretty awesome. But now I have an intro to scope rifle, which is a four day course and we go even further in depth, um, which I'm excited to teach up in Washington. Anyway, so all that happens, I'm learning the social media, I'm learning how to build it, how to grow it. I get invited to other long range courses. I get invited out to shoot with uh, people. Now I'm afforded the opportunity to not just shoot with and learn by, but make friends and mentors of people that I've looked up to for years in the shooting community and uh, expand my knowledge exponentially, right? I could, unlike before, up until the uh, coaches course where I have my life, boot camp, um, infantry, or and then the, the book, The Ultimate Sniper, and coaches course and all that teaching me, I can break that down. Everything in the last three coming on four years like I can't break down simply um, there's just been so many different things and I've got I've been afforded the opportunities to learn by learn with and shoot with and teach with like Frank Galley um, Kaylin and uh, Phil from MDS to uh, one of my best friends Lena Michalik she's fantastic to Lanny Barnes and like learn from people that are true experts in what they do and they have made their life around firearms and they have tied their not tied but their their life and philosophy and journey has traveled alongside their journey with firearms the same as mine and that's been fantastic to me and that's what really interests me is as i'm saying all this and i'm ex explaining all this how my my life's not just been intrinsically tied around firearms, but how I can measure things in my life by what's going on firearms wise. Okay, now I can very, very comfortably say that uh, there's many things in my life that, um, as far as what I believe in my philosophy about things that I can explain in the terms of marksmanship, in terms of fundamentals and uh, like emotional concepts of if I just got tripped up and I'm angry about something, that's like a missed shot. Okay, I need to learn from that missed shot, correct it, or figure out why I missed, correct it, re-engage. If I missed, if I'm angry or I'm upset or I'm irritated, there's something there that's tripping me up, I'm gonna figure out why, I'm gonna figure out where it's coming from, and I'm going to correct it so that the next time I come up against this, I'm gonna hit and I'm going to react in the way that I deem fit in the rain in the way that is, um, how do I say this? A way that is honorable and in a way that is representative of the person that I wish to be in the future. So <clears throat> that's very much how I think about it. Now, now I do this thing, right? Where I'm sitting in front of cameras or I'm running behind a camera and I'm shooting and I'm doing videos and I'm teaching classes and I'm managing websites and sales and marketing and my own business and relationships and working with companies. I just returned from SHOT Show. So there's, uh, I went there with an attack plan. This is how I'm gonna do this. This is who I'm gonna talk with. These are the meetings I set. I'm gonna leave with a tangible item and then uh, get back and knock out these uh, follow-up meetings and these deals for this following year and do that. And this goes into things like I got a class next, my class is next month in Texas to the month after that in Washington State to ta da 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 North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia um, to filming every week and shooting every week and recognizing my own ebbs and flows in my own shooting journey and my ebbs and flows in my own self because of things in the last year and a half that have been extremely painful and um, 
life threatening to myself that I've uh, that I've dealt with, and I'm I'm gonna say overcome, for lack of a better term, but have but I am working through still, and that's why I started putting out messages about mental health and men's, mental health awareness and things like that at the end of my YouTube videos. Um, because I think they're very wildly important and part of who I am and who I wish to be in the future is an introspective being that is also aware of himself in the moment and uh, working towards a better uh, moments in the future, but that's also who I wish to be as a shooter. And it comes down to like four things that I believe. I believe in connection between us all. I believe in, um, <laughs> I believe in teaching about life and the way that it can be and methods to work through it. Um, for those who don't know or have a hard time figuring those things out. And I also believe in extreme companionship from my brothers to my close friends to everything like that. Like I have, I keep relationships of extreme quality and uh, I work to maintain them effortlessly, not effortlessly, um, tirelessly is the word I was looking for, um, constantly. And I also believe in figuring oneself out because then we have power over ourselves and that is the ultimate power in our universe. I just happen to do all that through firearms. So those are, uh, those are the things that I believe and uh, um, boiled down into uh, four concepts. Um, and when I worked that out, it really, it really put a guide, uh, a light at the end of things for me and how I interact through the world and with people and relationships. Um, and it is, I'm not perfect at it. I'm not perfect at these things. These things I'm always working on and I'm good with that. And they're things I know I will always work on. Just like making sure my purpose is in front of me, even if my purpose is to find my purpose. Thank you, Lena, for teaching me that. Um, and recognizing that I can't see me the way that others see me, and as important as it is to know how they see me, it is more important, and I, I think it's important for me to know how they see me, because I need to know how I'm coming off, and I may be coming off in a way that I myself don't see. That's why it's important to me. It's not important to me what they think or feel, I just like to know the different perspectives because it gives me more insight into myself. Um, but what truly matters to me is if I've invested time and energy into you. Like I invest time and energy into my business. I invest time and energy into my curriculums. I, it took me, I think I worked on it for three straight months to really polish and make sure my curriculum for intro to scope rifle was as flawless as could be through all the lessons I've learned. So, and I mean, that's all the past and the present future. I don't know what my future holds shooting wise. I don't know what my future holds for my life. I know that I want to do more. I want to do bigger. I want to do more things. I want to shoot in other countries. I want to train in other countries. I want to hunt. I want to explore the life that my passions crave. And um, to me, that's a very important thing to do, so. All right, I've talked enough about myself. I just, it's actually been an interesting, almost cathartic healing thing to sit here and talk about um, from earliest age all the way up to now through life as far as uh, firearms and uh, how it's tied in and anyways I'm gonna get off my box now I appreciate you guys for sitting here as of right now I don't know how long this video is but I know it's lengthy so I've killed half my batteries I appreciate you for coming paying attention to the channel if you have any questions comments or concerns or anything to add on go ahead drop them to below I would love to engage with you about all this um, and if you have any questions about what's gone on in my life or anything like that, ask me, because maybe it's something I haven't thought of and it might help me figure something out, which might help you figure something out. And also, of course, like and subscribe. Those things help out tremendously. And I hate saying it all the time, but uh, yeah. And go check out the website, weaponsnatcher.com. Check out the training products and uh, article blogs. Those things are essential to me and since I you know I do this full time so this is how I live my life now and um, if you got questions on how you can too I'll answer the best of my ability and uh, help you out 
And as always, make sure you get out and bang. If you are still here, something I would like to share with you other than everything else I just vomited out is uh, <clears throat> maybe not in a way that I just did going back through my life and doing it on video, but make sure that you are thinking about moments in your life, in the, in the foundation of your life, so early youth, and especially in regards to your parents and your siblings, and think about them like, this is what I remember, this is how I felt. But then ask yourself, why? Why did I feel that way? Why did they do that? What do I know about them that can help me figure out what they were feeling or thinking at that time? What do I know about my parents now and the truth of my life now versus when I was growing up when it's easy to pull the wool over a kid's eyes to make sure that they're happy and they don't have to see the hardship that they're going through. And recognize that you know our parents are people too that they were just trying to figure it out the same way that we were trying to figure it out now. Right? So. One powerful thing is figuring out those things in your early childhood and how you recognize them now and how they've come to be. I have realized things in me uh, in this past month or in last month that are rooted in my childhood that I never even recognized before. And it's because I'm working on developing the skill of when I recognize something's up in me. Okay, let's think back. When did I feel like that last time and the last time and the last time and the last time and walk it back till, oh, that root thing right there and that's why it's grown ever since now that i know that and if i feel that again i can recognize it and realize that um, this is a me thing going on inside myself whatever that person who said it or did it their intent in the moment that's their intent it honestly has nothing to do with me and how i'm feeling so if that's something that you have a hard time with make sure you're focusing on that and developing that skill just like if you miss your shot Drive your reticle right back on target, self-actualize, aware your, make sure you're aware of your position, spot your impact, you're looking for how you're reacting now, and then correct it, walk back, what's wrong, figure it out, where was that root problem, and when you figured that out, you got your hold, press your shot, and then send it, and then, so you're gonna correct that behavior in yourself and gain power over it, and then hit the target every time the next time, and make sure you do that time and time and time again, okay? So again, I appreciate your time. Go spend time with your families, hang out with your kids, do whatever you're gonna do, get to the range, drop some rounds in a productive way, and get out and bang. Click. Get to the middle of the You go first, and I'll go and I'll go out. Hopefully Holly doesn't leave this time. It just goes over there and